All right, so part two of site characterization. You guys ready for more site characterization? Oh yeah, always ready. Remember the most important part. All right, so continuing this, um, this is the same set of learning objectives. This is just part two of the same presentation. So we're gonna start by thinking about our supplementary, uh, supplementary site investigations. So we, we went through and we talked about our preliminary site investigations. These were very well-informed investigations that we went out, and this gave us our um, report of findings that we've delivered, say, for our 30% design. And this is what a lot of the team members are using at this point to, to develop the design for features, where we're gonna place the pertinent structures, um, maybe thinking about the footprint of different design alternatives or possible alignments of our new embankment. And we're going to be going through that design process and new questions are cropping up. Maybe it's questions related to the particular location of a structure that we're gonna need a lot more detailed information for. Uh, maybe it's, we, we are now going for a, maybe a higher structure, which is now going to require a saddle dam feature that we're gonna to need to go out and provide additional investigations for. Maybe it is for a dewatering program that we've now identified we'll need due to the depth of excavation required based on our preliminary investigations or those preliminary investigations encountered a groundwater table that was a little bit different than what we had originally hypothesized in our working model of the site. These are all great examples of why we would be going out and doing supplementary site investigations, which will always happen in your new embankment design. Generally, always happen. So generally, most of the investigations are performed during the planning phase, but for many projects, we need those invest additional investigations. Um, here's more examples. I've already gone through a few of these dewatering because of our final excavation grade. The changes in design are going to require a different borrow source. Maybe initially we thought, oh, we'll need materials A, B, and C, but now we're going through and we need a much more extensive filter than we initially thought. Um, so we're looking for, for additional grain size gradations. The alignment changed. We encountered issues during our additional investigations, prompting us to go and better understand the subsurface for those areas. Um, and maybe we're going to go ahead and install our monitoring equipment that'll be um, in place prior to construction. Um, once we finalize those alignments and we're, we're getting ready to go, there might be some really critical areas that we need to monitor by inclinometer, or we need some um, locations for a piezometer that we're going to track maybe a pore water dissipation as the embankment comes up. There's also going to be investigations that are conducted during construction, and these always happen as well. We're going to be documenting our foundation conditions as they become accessible. Um, that's probably one of the biggest examples that folks would, would think of when you think about investigations or data, geologic data I'm collecting during construction. Um, we're finally exposing our final grade, uh, our final excavation for our site. That might be our first opportunity to get down and actually map. You'll always want to include the, the foundation mapping as part of the foundation acceptance for your project. Um, that means that we might have to treat the foundation, we might need some dental concrete, there's a lot of different things we might have to do, but that'll be determined after we map it. Um, we're also looking to detect possible adverse ground conditions so that we can employ measures to reduce or prevent construction difficulties. Some things that we're thinking about, of course, maintaining flexibility. Always be altering your uh, working hypothesis of your geologic model of the site as new information becomes available. We wanna keep our methods as simple as possible, um, especially once we're in the construction phase. Uh, we might need to determine if we have a changing need for instrumentation monitoring as our, um, our dam is being constructed or things are changing. Um, and, and we need to have a knowledgeable resource for groundwater management, unwatering, dewatering, also the control and conveyance of getting those unwatered or dewatered uh, fluids off of the site in a safe way. We also are probably having to consider NEPA and, and other items as well as we um, dispose of those removed waters. So we're gonna start with, uh, and this is also kind of going back to what we talked about in part one, but types of investigations. These could be employed for um, our preliminary investigations all the way through construction. And again, the definitions of three major types of investigations are non-intrusive. That's our geophysics, our surface mapping, um, and also don't think that you don't have to do NEPA or cultural compliance activities because you're doing a non-intrusive method. Often, um, especially certain states, will still require you to do all of your environmental and cultural compliance activities, um, even for these. Um, so be, be 
mindful of that. Accessible, again, that's accessible to a human, so our test pits, trenches, and then non-accessible, mechanical drilling and sampling. So starting with non-intrusive investigations, geophysics. Who here has any familiarity with um, conducting geophysics? Quite a few folks. All right, so what do we think about geophysics? So, eh. Do you have anybody in here who is a geophysicist? Oh, I can make fun of them all day then. All right, I'll try to refrain. Um, these are surficial methods that are very useful in the early stages of our investigations because they can help inform a lot of parameters that we go out and ground truth later. Um, so reconnaissance level investigations. Um, also, we might be doing them after our drilling to look at our data gaps uh, or to help um, fill in those data gaps and connect the dots. It's rapid collection for a, a lot of these, and a lot of times these techniques are pretty inexpensive to the project. Um, but we can correlate features such as stratigraphy, groundwater, bedrock, lithology, and material densities pretty quickly. And this is no substitute for ground truthing, but if I go out and I'm really trying to characterize the foundation bedrock or the right abutment, I have some concerns that there might be some anomalous zones within the bedrock, I can go out and have my drilling program um, in tandem with maybe some uh, seismic refraction or electrical resistivity of that abutment. Um, and now I'm, I'm using the correlation of all the material properties I collected during drilling to connect the dots. And perhaps the geophysics would identify an anomalous zone between my drill holes. And maybe that's my area of concern. I can go out and target investigations in that location and say, ah, this is it. I found the zone prior to building the dam here that we need to treat. Um, a little overview, geophysics is a, think about it in terms of scale, because it covers all scales. We might start at our, um, you know, thinking biggest picture, global scale, our satellite-based and remote sensing options. Um, a lot of times you might see a, a hydrologic study or some pretty cool groundwater studies that have been completed using almost entirely remote, sense, remote sensing methods. So there are a lot of applications, um, a lot of great things there. As I move to a a more uh, closer to my project scale. I might look at air airborne geophysics that can be extremely useful. I'm um, getting closer. I'm looking at ground-based remote sensing methods. Maybe that's interferometry or other types of things that could be a change detection. Um, often that's used in construction as well. Um, ground-based geophysics at a more local scale. And this is uh, now we're getting to the point of the resolution of my data being collected might be on the order of anywhere from a meter to a centimeter to even a millimeter. But definitely um, quiz your geophysicists as they're explaining these techniques about that final resolution because it definitely varies by depth. It varies by maybe location from transducer. So definitely understand what you're getting into when you're hiring a geophysicist. Um, at the most, at the smallest scale, once we reach that one millimeter scale, we're looking at um, changes that were collected maybe by pressure transducer and things like that. Um, a little bit more on common methods that relate to dams and levees. For ground-based methods, you're probably going to want to familiarize yourself with things like electrical resistivity, um, ground penetrating radar. You know, GPR might be great for your upper um, 20 meters of the ground, and it might be great for identifying a buried object that's made of metal, but it would also have limitations, so it's important to understand that. Those EM techniques, um, you might be looking for discontinuities. And again, you're looking for very near, near surface type of things. Um, again, the seismic refraction or seismic tom tomography. Um, and if you ever are listening to a geophysicist talk and they keep talking about the seismic lines they ran, they're talking about seismic refraction, not seismic reflection. Um, that's a totally different technique, but uh, I like to think about it as reflect deeply into the earth or reflect deeply on things. Um, you're talking about extremely deep methods that would not be at all applicable to a site. So refraction for when they're using the word seismic. Um, airborne methods that you still might see, especially if you're looking at like levees and reach effects or really large project areas. There's helicopter surveys, different types of EM that's electromagnetic, and then other types of gravity and magnetic surveys. Magnetic can be great in a karst environment because you might be able to identify big solution features below the ground surface. Uh, this is an example of a um, geophysical study I was a part of at a dam in New Mexico. Um, the left abutment is entirely built on a landslide. We're trying to identify features of that landslide that were going to be very problematic to our project. Um, and it, all I would want to say here is that the results were valid. 
the results were able to be ground truthed. So I, even though there should be a healthy amount of skepticism from the information you're driving from geophysics, just know that it can be extremely valuable to your project and the overall picture when you're when this is one piece of evidence for the overall crime scene. Uh, mapping is another, um, of course, common non-intrusive method. We use that, of course, to identify our surficial features that are outcropping. Um, we There might be limited outcrops that are available, but you can still drive a lot of information by projecting uh, features, maybe our discontinuities into the ground surface. Um, we would add information to our, our mapping by aerial photography, satellite images, of course, our drill hole information, rock samplings, previous mapping efforts. Uh, this is something that you, you should have a, a well put together geologic map, especially once you're in that supplemental um, investigation phase to deliver to the project team because they might have to design differently across all of these features. Also, when you're mapping, make sure you're getting that into a spatial format that can be used on the computer. It's, it's not particularly useful as a hand-drawn image. So it needs to be converted. Make sure that's in your scope of work as you're going through things that we're going to get this into GIS or CAD or whatever it needs to be. Um, so next we're going to look at accessible investigations. Uh, does anyone know what that image on the right is called? I'll give you a hint. It's something that's very banned nowadays, but this picture is from the 70s. They got a poor geologist here hooked up probably to the uh, some sort of pull, you know rope system. They're about to lower him down this particular type of drill hole that is, is no longer used in investigations. It's a calyx. Yeah, you might see that in, in text from historic investigations, but nowadays they're not going to stick the geologist hundreds of feet down a drill hole. Fortunately, I suppose. As a geologist, I'll say. Thanks for not doing that anymore. Um, but here's a few examples of some accessible inf um, investigations. This is from the USBR Earth Manual, which is another really great reference. All of these are available online for free. Um, I, I definitely downloaded if you're looking for additional information. Uh, methods like trenching, test pits, accessible borings. Those are calyx holes. They're no longer any such thing as an accessible boring. We don't put humans down boreholes anymore. Um, this is out of date. And uh, tunnels and drifts. Um, of course, those are accessible. So there's additional information about the limitations, maybe the economic implications of some of these um, and some other comments. Um, accessible investigations have a lot of advantages. I can get a large sample. Um, maybe I have a, a large grain size distribution and my cobbles, you know, I have five inch cobbles. If I'm going to run and get an accurate gradation on these materials, I might be looking at sacks and sacks of this material um, as required from the lab. So this is another opportunity to make sure you're working with your lab specialist as you're planning these investigations. Because if you say, I need an accurate gradation of this glacial till, including my oversized material, they're going to say, well, I need, I need one ton or two tons of geologic material to be delivered to my site, which immediately tells me I'm, I'm looking at a pretty big test pit. Um, again, it's also ideal for your borrow area characterization to run test pits and trenches. You, you know, it's informative to have these large excavations. You also are getting information about the rippability of the material, um, accessibility, and things like that. Um, trenches are vital for fault characterization and looking for those displacements and aging things. It also allows us to map and characterize material contacts. If I'm giving you information about my borrow area and I say, well, the material that is going to be of interest is three feet deep um, by you know, on this 20 foot by 20 foot swath. That's probably inaccurate. I've never seen such perfect planar geology. Um, but if I can give a, a great characterization of that material contact from opening up a test trench, I can say what's a wavy gradational boundary. The waviness is going to span several feet. Um, we don't want to be excavating material below the two week mark or two feet mark because beyond that, we're we're getting outside of our um, you know, maybe there's that gradational contact. So just be mindful of things like that. Um, but for your accessible investigations, watch out for groundwater. Um, think about the location. And also be, be very cognizant if you need special requirements in the backfilling. Does it need to be backfilled to a certain density? Um, is this within the footprint of an area that may not uh, may have some future use to it? So definitely pay attention to that. I have seen test pits collapse before. Always pay attention to your test pit safety. Have somebody who has reviewed the material. Um, OSHA has strict requirements for setbacks and how to excavate your test pit. 
Um, make sure there's somebody on site who is familiar with those OSHA rules and can design your test pit safely. Otherwise, you want to have that a trench box or something in there to protect your staff. Um, when I've seen them collapse before, I saw one collapse. There was nobody in the test pit, but they had encountered a, a an open gravel kind of near the base of the test pit, and water was able to very rapidly undermine the side wall of the test pit, and the whole side wall top, uh, toppled in. And it could have been very dangerous if anybody was in that test pit. Oh, I have an image. This is my video, actually. I didn't know I put that in here. Look, okay. So off the bat, though, what's wrong with this test pit? It's too deep. Um, in this case, it was never planned for anybody to go in it. There was a contact that they were chasing, and they hadn't encountered yet. Um, there was an anomalous zone here that it was much deeper. So anyways, obviously no human would have ever been in this test pit because it's far too deep. You don't go below four feet without designing your next level of setback. And here's a little bit on some of those OSHA rules. You need to know if you're type A, B, or C soil. That's in the OSHA guideline. Um, you need to know the maximum slope for the type of soil you're dealing with. C is the most unfavorable, so that's why you have that um, gradual slope on your setback. Test pit sampling, there's a lot of really cool things you can do in a test pit. Most of the time we're thinking about our disturbed samples. We can get those giant sacks, send them off to the lab. I'm able to collect samples perhaps for dispersivity testing. Brian's going to talk about that later. Um, I also have the opportunity to do some in-place density measurements. Um, I can conduct sand cones, my ring densities. Does anyone know what the difference between doing a ring density versus a sand cone is? When would I consider one over the other? I'll give you a hint. Material size, exactly, that's exactly it. Um, a sand cone is only 18 inches in diameter, where my ring densities might be six feet, uh, three, six feet, or even I've seen some of them are large, but those are enormous holes that you end up digging. But if I have a lot of gravelly material and I'm, say, assessing the potential for liquefaction at the site, and I, I do need that in-place density um, with the larger grain size material, I'm going to have to pursue those ring densities, those much larger sizes. Um, let's see, getting disturbed material, uh, determining consistency. Um, those are all different things that we might be looking for in our test pit. Block samples can also be great for lab testing. This is a mostly intact sample. Uh, another quiz question, which is the correct term? Do we use the word intact sample or undisturbed sample? You have a hint because the correct word's on the slide. We, we generally are wanting to use the word intact now, and this is um, something that has been more recently pushed because um, if you guys have met maybe um, uh, uh, Bobby Reinhardt, Dr. Bobby Reinhardt, or other folks that are on the ASTM committees, they will tell you that there's no such thing as an undisturbed sample, that even the fact that I have excavated this block and I'm going to try and shear it off and get it to the lab is as easily as possible. I'm still bouncing it on a bumpy road on the drive to the lab. I still am relieving the stress that was confining that block of material. Um, so nothing is truly undisturbed. And I, I spent about six years working with Bobby at Reclamation, and he drove that into my mind every day. He's like, intact. It's an intact sample. Um, so I, I'm still purging undisturbed from my vocabulary, too. So if you're still using the word undisturbed, don't worry. This is a more recent push. Um, but keep in mind that nothing is truly uh, representative of the intact condition of the ground once it's removed from the ground. Um, Hand-carved cylinder samples, they can be like block samples in a tube. I've seen little Shelby's pushed in a test pit. There's all sorts of cool things you can do. Um, so now we're to drilling. Our subsurface geotechnical exploration is performed for primarily three purposes. We want to know what distinct masses of rock and soil exist in our foundation or borrow area or area of interest. We want to know the dimensions of those bodies, and we want to get the properties of those bodies. Um, there's a, this is a cool image of this is drilling in the Eagle Forge Shale in Texas, um, and I'm, you're looking at the, this really cool weathering contact between the unweathered shale on the left, this beautiful dark charcoal color, and then the color it weathers to, which is this much more, um, you know what, also tan is not a geologic color. You should never use the word tan. Make sure you have your Munsell book with you for the correct colors. And there's a Munsell chart for soils, and there's a different Munsell chart for rock. So make sure you're using the correct chart. I was going to say tan, but this would probably be what they call like yellowish, orangish, brown. Or I mean, the colors get pretty uh, descriptive there. 
Um, we also see this where there is a discontinuity that gypsum has been deposited in. There's recent flow, and it's also heavily oxidized the shale around the boundary of that. Um, so pretty cool things can be gathered from your drilling program, of course. Uh, there's different types of ways that we can go out and drill at the site. Um, some of the common ones that a lot of us have probably used and heard about, mud rotary, holostem auger, diamond coring, sonic drilling. Sonic drilling especially lately has gained a lot of steam. I know a lot of agencies are acquiring their own sonic rigs. There's a lot um, in the private realm that can be also contracted for projects. Um, we, I know I've used Cascade Drilling for Sonic and, and other drilling companies as well. Uh, excellent. So if you're working in the core, Savannah District does have a Sonic rig. Sonic is great. I'm a big Sonic fan. I think I, I might have a slide about Sonic in a second. Um, and really, we, we divide our drilling methods into three big categories. No fluid, no air. Yes fluid or yes air. And you'll want to know the pros and cons of each of these drilling methods and when they're appropriate for your site, maybe what depths they target. Um, Non-fluid, non-air, you'll see a lot for maybe an existing dam structure. That's your holostem auger, um, sonic, a continuous flight auger, which is not used as frequently. Um, here's one. If I'm working in an existing dam area, should I be using a single flight auger? It's not on the list. No, you can have a lot of problems with that type of drilling method. I don't see that very frequently anymore, unless you're using an old failing 1500 drill rig. Um, your hole collapses on you in, in some cases. There's other methods, direct push. You, um, a lot of folks, especially for a very small area, you can get those very small remote controlled rigs to go and do direct push investigations. But that's more, normally going to be more soil based or agricultural based because they don't have a lot of oomph to them if they're a small rig. Fluid-based methods, a lot of us, again, are going to be familiar with mud rotary. Mud rotary. There's also um, the, the reverse circulation of mud rotary. Basically, am I pushing the fluid down the center or down the um, sidewalls of the drill hole? And in, in, in which is the return fluid? So there's the down fluid and the up fluid, so reverse um, versus standard. Uh, there's also the water-powered downhole hammer and then air-based air rotary, things like Odex. Um, those can be great for getting through some hard materials. You know, I remember one time going through a gravel shell very, very far away from the core of a dam. Odex was extremely efficient to get through that um, bouldery random fill shell. Um, selecting your drilling method requires an understanding of the investigation and your sampling objectives and also what materials you're working with. Um, so that means that sometimes we have to do a multi-method hole. That does get a little bit more expensive, but it might be the best way to ultimately get the results you need and, and also with the cost savings. Um, because we might be looking at a certain depth of this drill hole, sampling requirements that vary and target lithologies that vary. If I'm moving through the, the maybe the, the upper portion and I'm in a, a soily overburdened environment, I might be using my holostem auger to get through those materials and maybe I, I'm able to continuously sample from my auger that way. As soon as I hit the bedrock, I'm going to keep this drill hole going, but maybe I'm switching over to mud rotary at that point um, or at some other coring technique. And that would be an example of a multi-use hole um, to get to my target depth ultimately. We're also thinking about advancement rate. It's going to vary across all these methods, the amount of time it's going to take, site access. Some of these rigs are a lot bigger than others. Um, health and safety, of course, and cost. Um, most of those drilling methods, just remember they are optimize to maximize your performance for one set of conditions. So it's, it's crucial to understand that. A little bit more on drilling. Uh, let's see. Of course, drilling is suitable for our, our foundation characterization because we're getting a lot of engineering properties of the subsurface, but it's point data. It's a point here, it's a point there. Um, holes can be vertical or angled. A lot of times if you're dealing with, say, a sandstone type environment, and I want to characterize all my jointing and discontinuities or maybe limestone as well. I, you know, I'm going to understand as, the, as a geologist that a lot of times my jointing is going to be vertical in these environments. And then maybe I have horizontal discontinuities as well. I can gather my horizontal discontinuities with a vertical hole, but I'm going to miss virtually every single vertical joint. So there's certain times where you want to consider an angled hole. 
So you can better characterize the, the joint frequency, the joint spacing, maybe the openness, and all of the things that are going to be pretty critical to your design when you're thinking about all the seepage that's otherwise going to happen in this bedrock. Um, think about whether your drill hole is going to be suitable in soil or rock or both. Um, a new dam site, I always heard this as a rule of thumb. Greg, I don't know what you think about this, but you generally are going to investigate to a depth of 1.5 to 2 dam heights into the foundation and your abutments. Yeah, so if your dam's 100 feet tall, I'm probably going 200 feet into my foundation pre-dam, so I can truly understand the impact of the structure on my site. Um, keep in mind the risks associated with your drilling methods, this is especially if there's an existing sensitive structure. If you're rebuilding the dam, if this is a, a new dam that we're removing and replacing, um, think about the risks to the structure. Keep in mind that you always want to investigate outside of the footprint of your structure to obtain your data. And again, I, you go back to that Malpasse case history, that dam failed due to conditions that existed outside of the footprint of the dam. The joint sets that caused the foundation to fail outcropped far outside of the footprint of the dam. Drilling and embankment uh, limits methods, sampling and testing, that's true. Um, that would be if we had an existing structure. We're a little bit limited, perhaps, in some cases. But a little creative thinking, you can probably still get what you need. Um, is there a plan for remediation if a problem arises? And again, make sure we're following those regulations if you're in an existing structure. This is probably a little small. Um, I think it's clear if you zoom in a little bit, but um, this is just a figure that shows different types of um, techniques or, or methods of field investigation and what we can get from it. Um, you know, maybe the rock properties, rock mass qualities, um, depth to certain uh, contacts, rock mass properties, weakness zones, etc. Um, this is just a, a general overview table from the Paulstrom 2015 textbook, which is a great one to have on your shelf, uh, especially if you deal with rock. That's a rock engineering textbook that I highly recommend. So this takes us to sampling and testing. Um, a little bit of a story, I was talking to Greg at the break, and he mentioned a case where they had done a big expensive field investigation program, or, or, or this, this team had, and the samples came back to the lab, and though all the samples were collected at the depths and intervals they were supposed to be, they weren't handled correctly. And these Shelby tube samples were not sealed properly. Um, so by the time they got to the lab, the samples had desiccated, they were already cracked, and it makes them completely invalid for testing. So either you're going to be repeating tens of thousands of dollars in investigations to go back out and get those samples, or you're missing critical information, which it's, it's, that's unacceptable. So you're probably repeating investigations. Also, if you have to go back to the client and say, hey, I, uh, I, I need another 75K, um, you know, my samples are cracked, and they say, what happened? And you say, well, we just didn't handle the samples properly. They're probably not giving you more money. This, this is probably coming out of your own company's pocket. Um, so be very, very, very mindful when you're going through your testing and sampling program that all facets have been covered. And we'll go through some of those right now. Because this can be an expensive mistake to, mess, to, to make. So sample selection for laboratory tests and field tests may involve um, soil samples, without regard to their in-place condition or the deposit. And that's what we would call a disturbed sample. If I'm doing my um, hollow stomager and I've, I've pulled up the center core and I've opened it up and I just take my gloved hand or my hand and grab a big sample and throw it in some jars or you know my, my double gallon bag, those are disturbed samples. They no longer represent the in-situ ground conditions at all. Maybe in a test pit, I'm grabbing big stack samples. These are great for standard physical properties my gradation, my moisture content, my Atterberg limits, and things like that. Um, I might also be considering uh, the need for soil samples with the nat uh, natural in-place conditions preserved, and that's what we're going to call intact. Used to be called undisturbed, but there's, there's definitely that push, and they're pushing for it in the ASTMs to use the word intact. And then third, we might be looking at the soils as they exist in the foundation. Um, of course, by intact sample, I mean I'm I'm collecting it as intact as possible, but I'm still shipping it off to the lab. And versus number three on this list, um, this is something I'm doing while I'm on site. Maybe I'm doing a, a downhole test in my drill hole. Maybe I'm down in my test pit doing a sand cone, things like that. 
So we're in text sampling. Here's some examples of, and things that you might have come across during your careers. If I'm in soil, let's say I'm using my Holostem auger, I have the option of lining my auger with an acrylic liner. Um, there's other times that you might be using these acrylic liners. They might go in a direct push type rig. Um, this would be that I'm able to remove my liner, um, immediately cap it, immediately seal it. You're, there's going to be additional field procedures that you have to do if you're the geologist um, to get that to the lab. Um, so that would be an intact sample. Um, push samplers, uh, these are often different types of tubes, a Shelby tube. Has anyone worked with Shelby tubes before? Okay, quite a few folks. We have medical, medical metal cylinders of different sizes. Make sure you've talked to your engineers and your lab specialists prior to sizing that. Don't be the geologist saying like, yeah, three inches is fine, when in reality, because of the grain size distribution, you needed a six inch or, or a different diameter. There's also different types of push samplers. Your hydraulically activated piston samplers, those are often highly preferred if you have a rig that's capable of doing that. There's also mechanically activated piston samplers, but again, I think that hydraulic uh, piston is, is definitely preferred. There's also the modified push drill samplers, your double tubes, those are pitcher barrels, Denison barrels. I think I used to see pitcher barrels used a lot. I feel like I don't see them used as frequently anymore, but they can be very useful in questionable conditions like a very poorly indurated sandstone or, or things like that, because they, they offer more oomph than a single barrel. Um, to get that intact sample, but it might be material that will fall apart when you're coring. So it's kind of this in-between material. Uh, for rock, that's a little bit easier. We're going to go core. This is assuming the rock is rigid enough to uh, be cored, um, and there's just there's different types. In situ field testing, we have a lot of options, and a lot of these can yield really, really important data. Standard present penetration tests are SPTs. That gives us the N value, or blow counts. That relates to the in place or the in situ density of the material. Cone, penetra uh, cone penetrometer testing, CPTs, again, give us a lot of information. Um, it, it doesn't advance through um, as dense of materials, so be mindful of the refusal requirements for CPT. You might see this in a clay, soil, things like that. SPTs, uh, what material do we most often use SPTs for? Sand, yeah. Definitely. We want to be careful with great gravel gradations over 20% because often that means we're starting to invalidate our SPT. Um, you get deflections, especially if you have large gravels. Your SPT is only two inches in diameter, two and a half inches, um, so it's easy to deflect on a gravel. You can do gravel corrections to try and save your test, but probably you're just beating up your equipment at that point. Um, CPT has even a little bit less of a threshold for what type of gravelly environment it can go through, around 15, 10 to 15%, I believe. Does anyone know if it's 10 or 15%? I don't recall exactly for CPT. Okay, but generally you're gonna be double checking um, all the ASTMs, double check that if it's suitable for your material. The, you have the, um, the, on this figure we show the DMT, the diatometer test, um, that's going to be testing resistance of your borehole. Um, we see the PMT, that's probably something that we don't see used as frequently, that's a pre-board pressure meter test. But um, when you're looking at the stress fields in the subsurface, that can be very useful and actually probably relevant to new dam construction. Vein shear is probably something you guys have heard of, um, and that's going to be giving us information about the in situ shear resistance of the soil. There's also other types of in situ field testing, such as testing for permeability. And I know Brian will talk a little about some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, we might be looking for um, pressure permeability, uh, gravity-driven permeability tests, falling head, constant head, and slug tests. And all of these are more or less appropriate depending on the environment you're dealing with and your expected permeability. If you expect it to be a very high permeability, you're looking at different methods than if you're expecting a quite low permeability. A big one, your downhole camera and optical televiewer, that's a great opportunity. You already have the hole open, you might as well take a picture of it because this is otherwise an inaccessible hole. Um, so definitely consider the option for downhole cameraing you get a great view of discontinuities in the ground surface and items like that. So I highly recommend it. Engineering properties of earth materials. So here is a, a, a recap of Soil Mechanics 101. Just kidding, we won't go into that much detail. Here's some examples of engineering properties and material that are relevant to your dam design and information that you're going to want to deliver to your design folks. 
we're thinking in terms of, again, those standard physical properties, that's our gradations, Atterbergs, things like that. We're also looking at density. Density is often obtained by either our in situ testing, our intact testing, uh, things like that. We're going to be wanting to offer up information for consolidation and swell, maybe chemical properties, permeability information, cementation, dispersion potential. Um, of course, all of our resistance information here is listed as penetration data. Um, be familiar with the, if, if you're the one conducting site characterization, just be familiar with how you can acquire these data points. Uh, what testing I have to do, what lab tests I may have to order, and if it's simply something I'm going to ship off to the lab, how do I collect and handle that information? Um, soil gradations, so why is that important to our dam design? That one's pretty obvious. We might get indicators of compressibility, shear strength, hydraulic conductivity, and susceptibility to certain failure modes from this material. Um, it all depends, but gradations are generally the starting point that we're looking for in our dam design. Atterbergs, uh, this is the critical water content in my fine-grained material. Um, just as a reminder for the non-geotechs in the room, what we're talking about, soils can exist in a solid, semi-solid, plastic, or liquid state. So when they're calling, they're asking about the liquid limit, they're talking about the, the limit, water content limit between the liquid and the plastic state, or the plastic limit is going to be between that plastic and semi-solid state. And again, the shrinkage limit between the semi-solid and solid state. Um, if it helps to be familiarized with this stuff. If you practice it, you know this very well. Our soil plasticity can be an indicator of the potential for volume changes in my foundation, the shear strength of the materials, and again, the susceptibility to certain failure modes. USCS classification came about. Does anyone know the time frame that the USCS classification system came about? Yeah, yell it out in the back too, Brian. World War II, exactly. This was for rapid airfield design. They needed a way to, to get in there, design an airfield qu quickly. So Casa Grande came up with a system called the USCS, the United Soil Unified Soil Classification System. So everybody was characterizing the materials in the context of engineering properties, um, that being our texture, our grain size, um, things like that. This is now the most common soil classification system in geotech engineering, and it came, up, came about pretty recently in the last um, 60, 70 years. I still have to subtract from year 2000. I think everybody does. So I'm like, oh yeah, it was like six years ago. Um, again, yeah, developed by Casa Grande during World War II. It was then later modified by Casa Grande, USACE, and USBR to apply to dam foundations in their construction. Um, so the, these federal agencies in, in the dam building world um, were a heavy influence on the USCS cl classification system we use today. Rock characterization. This is extremely critical for understanding how seepage, stability, and seismic loading is going to affect our foundation and our abutments and our site in general. Um, here's some standard descriptors for rock uh, discontinuities. Be mindful of these. They are very important to your site and the potential design. But we're looking at the type of discontinuity. Is this a bedding plane, a joint, a fracture, oleation if, if it's a metamorphic rock? Um, a rock quality designation that can be very important. That's RQD. And that's going to play into a lot of your thoughts about the strength and quality of the rock you're building on. Fracture density, fracture spacing, continuity, openness, roughness, items like that. Look at the, again, that Bureau of Reclamation Engineering Geology Field Manual for great descriptions of all that information. One thing that's very, very useful at your site for rock characterization is photogrammetry. This is something that is starting to be used much, much more commonly. You'll hear about it in the Isabella case history later this week, um, the ongoing construction there. This allows you to build a 3D image of your site, and there is software that you can even project discontinuities into the subsurface. The example in this photo is Atom Tech out of Australia. Um, there's, there's several others as well. Uh, when we're thinking of our investigations, uh, these detailed investigations for construction materials in particular, there's a few items in, uh, that we're keeping in mind. Um, investigations are progressive as we go. We are going to be inventorying all of our available natural materials at the site. Construction materials may be identified initially by things like the surface exploration, our landforms. We know about that landform. We know it's probably going to offer us the gravel we need. Um, and then our subsurface investigations. We've already conducted these. We have an idea of the materials that are located in certain locations. If we want to conduct an economical and adequate design, we have to remember that we are inventorying 
all of our available materials very carefully that can be considered for borrow. And to the best of our ability, the spatial extents vertically and the variability within those materials. And we're gonna be reporting all that information very clearly. Um, the significant features, the occurrence of the soil properties and how they vary. You don't wanna overstate the availability of borrow material and get out there and have a borrow shortage. That can be a major delay and a major cost detriment to your site. Designing a dam materials usage plan. This is something that the Isabella case history will cover in good detail. Um, so I won't go into it too much here, but you'll wanna be accounting for all those soil particles from when they're in the ground initially, excavation, processing, and placement in your project. Um, this is a, a chart. You can review this in more detail later. Engineering use chart for compacted soils. And this would provide a USCS classification such as lean clay, CL, or clay gravel, GC, and uh, some of its usage, um, what it's ideal for and what you should not be using this material for. Um, so the next few slides will cover borrow selection and some material borrow concepts. Um, this is an image from Design of Small Dams showing an example of um, some of those scheduling items that are going to go into your construction specifications and planning um, for borrow materials. What you're really seeing here is how different um, zones of your dam are put together. Um, you're thinking about your material balance plans, and as Greg was mentioning, um, making sure that there's enough suitable quantity of material for the ultimate use, and how it might be tracked over the course of borrow to placement. Um, a few concepts, and the next couple of slides, I think, are, are from you, Greg, from uh, material borrow concepts. So if, you want to chime in, or I'm not sure who these slides came from, but if you want to chime in, please do. Um, one of the big concepts that we're thinking about when we're thinking about our borrow areas is volume loss of the borrow material. Uh, we are comp compacting the embankment, perhaps a density that was greater than these materials were in the ground. Um, there's going to be spill from equipment. There's going to be spill along the way. We're excavating material. We're hauling it. We're processing it, potentially. We're hauling it, and then we're placing it. So account for the spillage, and, and we'll go through some of the considerations for that in the next couple of slides. Um, and then compaction of the borrow source floor. Um, a few borrow area best practices. Uh, make sure that you have more volume in the borrow source than the calculated embankment volume. This is 150%, but I think two times sounds much more conservative, and we like to be conservative. Um, the required borrow area may be reduced as more information is developed about the material. And additional material may be needed to compensate for compression of material during construction. And you guys are going to cover more um, in a later module about uh, compression. So this is running through an example. Do you want folks to run through this example, or do you want me to just talk through it? I'll just talk through it. OK, so this is how we might be calculating the potential for shrinkage. What we are considering is the dry unit weight of our in-place borrow material divided by the dry unit weight of the compacted borrow material. So if we're removing material that is greater in size than five inches, our oversize or our, our, our largest particle size, our max, um, max particle size you might see in a drill hole log, we would use the unit weight of the less than five inch material. We're definitely not using the unit weight of our, our cobbly materials. If you're removing material with less, um, Oh, sorry, if, if, and again, if that greater than five inch gradation rock is used in the embankment, swell actually occurs um, from your borrow source because we're excavating rock that is neatly packed in place. Um, now we're inducing voids into the material by placing it randomly. So you're going to have about 20% more material when you place that rock material um, than what it was in the ground. Is there anything else you wanted to cover on this slide? Does that cover it? Exactly, yeah. Exactly, and you can picture it. Maybe I'm blasting a rock source to get my riprap material. So I have a nice, neat block of rock and I've blasted it to smithereens. Of course, I'm gonna have a larger container of riprap now. Um, so a, a, a rock materials investigation example, um, I have a zoned embankment core design that requires 2 million, 2.3 million cubic yards of material. Um, the property that I'm using for my borrow has 15 feet of material over a certain area. 
Um, I know that six inches I have to strip because it's covered in grass and there's root development. And 20% of my borrow area is going to have a greater than five inch by volume gradation up to 18 inches max. Um, my shrinkage factor of the core material is going to be five inches or minus five inches. So uh, I believe that goes to a factor of 0 0.85. And this well factor of the plus five inch material or my cobbles is going to be 0.25 or 25%. So how many acres of land am I going to have to uh, require in my specifications to have a 1.5 safety factor on that 2.3 million cubic yards? And if you were to run through the, the math on this, we want to go ahead, we take our, the overall embankment core that we need and we apply our shrinkage factor. And then we're going to apply the factors uh, related to the plus five inch material and go through this exercise. I won't go through it in too much detail because it's kind of hard to follow with materials if you're not, or calculations if you're not doing them yourself. Um, once I account for my six inches of stripping, the cubic you know, area or the cubic volume of that, um, and then I added my 50% contingency, I, I'm able to calculate the acreage that I'm requiring in my specifications. Um, spend some more time with that if you are interested. Um, for borrow area for pervious materials, we're thinking of our sand and gravel borrow sources. Uh, we're, we're going to have to consider if we're looking at a, swing, a shrink or swell environment. If this is a quarried rock fill source, we're thinking of swell. Again, that rock is nice and neat in place, and we're going to blast it and introduce all sorts of now class-supported voids of the smaller um, core sizes of my rocks. Um, blasted rock requires separation for various zones, removal of fines. You are inducing a lot of fines when you're blasting. Uh, we want to characterize voids of the rock gradation. Uh, the quarry sized, let's see. We're going to be providing calculations for intact rock and the, the waste. Um, there will be a lot of waste. If you are doing a blasting operation for your material borrow, you're going to have to account for a, a waste disposal site. And you want to also have calculated about how much waste you're going to be um, accumulating. And that's something that Isabella presentation they're going to cover as well. So lastly, we're going to touch on some identification of potential hazards. Um, these are some of the pretty obvious ones when we are looking at our site. And, and these are things that we are also probably conducting detailed investigations for if we have the, if they're known to exist at our site. So landslides, uh, mineral dissolution. Dissolution can occur um, in many different materials. Maybe that's our limestone, gypsum. A big, uh, bad one would be an anhydrite. Um, gypsum and anhydrite are chemically the same, but gypsum has the presence of water already in the chemical structure and hydrate doesn't. So an anhydrite goes into dissolution at an exponential rate. Does anyone know of an international project that had anhydrite in the foundation? A very important name. If you're looking at a project and you see the word gypsum or anhydrite, pay attention. These are very, very dangerous materials, especially when we are going to add a reservoir of recent water that's slightly acidic to infiltrate into that ground. You're going to be expediting a lot of dissolution that that ground probably has not recently seen. There's a lot of projects, a lot of projects in, our, in the U.S. Um, along the front range of the Rocky Mountains and, and other areas um, across the arid west that have issues with gypsum and, and anhydrite dissolution. And it, it's a problem that will span the life of your project. So pay attention. And of course, hazards related to rock and soil erosion. Those are pretty obvious. I'm going to go through this briefly. Brian's going to cover it in more detail. If you're doing your site visit and you see deep erosion gullies, I see kind of like tunnel erosion patterns, cloudy water in the ponds, things like that, uh, I'm immediately keyed into the potential for dispersive soils. And I'm going to probably be including these types of um, field methods to ac acquire materials um, for those ASTMs and for those laboratory tests. And Brian's going to cover that more later. I want to point out a few hazards that are special to concrete dams, but we still pay attention even in our embankment dam design. Um, in both cases, the foundations are the weak point, and uh, we want to be very mindful of discontinuities in the foundation. I just bring this up because we do have embankment dams that are founded in steep valleys where we otherwise might have also built a rock foundation, in, in, or sorry, a, a concrete dam. Um, so you want to be mindful of the same things, even if we're building an embankment dam. 
um, mapping those rock discontinuities, monitoring for our water pressures, monitoring seeps, and things like that. And one of the, the really concerning things that comes out for your embankment dam that might be in one of these steep canyon type features is the possibility of scour against the contact with your embankment dam. You might see this in the form of open discontinuities. Um, you might see a, a localized gradient at some point, um, maybe even related to your seepage cutoff feature that's causing that. Um, so be very, very mindful of how your design elements in your dam are going to work with the surrounding abutment geology. I just point that out that we, you should still understand what happens to the foundations and abutments of concrete dams when you're building an embankment dam, because they can still be in, influence them very much. And so lastly, data gaps and the observational method. So just some initial thoughts on data gaps. I have a few quotes here that I really liked. Um, this first one, the more time, energy, and effort that you expend in examining the subsurface geology of a job site, the more complex the structure, stratigraphy, and geomorphology often appears. Uh, that just means you need to take more time to resolve your, your working hypothesis. Um, geologists use their imaginations rooted in experience and case histories to provide a plausible and coherent narrative for characterization of the subsurface, despite having large knowledge gaps. That's from Pete Schaffner. Some of you guys might have met him before he retired. Um, never forget, it's what you don't recover from your subsurface sampling that is often the most important information. Um, that's especially relevant if I'm like liquefaction studies or I'm looking at materials below the groundwater table. I go down, those materials are so difficult to recover. I might I see, you know, see no recovery, no recovery, no recovery, but those are the most problematic materials. Maybe they're the lowest density or the potentially the most problematic to my site. Um, and again, good site characterization involves critical assessment of the geologic and geomorphic setting. Start here first. And I think we've really honed in on that one. Um, I'm not gonna go through all this. You can read through it on your own time. Um, case histories are one of the best places to start for looking at your data gaps because these are things that were missed in the past and we're subject to miss again if we don't understand them. Understanding the potential failure modes that are potentially going to impact your proposed structure and we're gonna go through that a lot more detail this week. And again, re rely on your multidisciplinary team, communicate regularly, ask what each team member needs to reduce their uncertainty because as a geologist, I certainly am not aware of, of everything that everyone else needs. Um, this is an example of a liquefaction uh, potential for a site. And these are some of the ex uh, different testing methods I'm going to use to reduce my uncertainty. And again, I'm using that multidisciplinary approach to collect evidence from all different sources. This is, this is all of my corroborative evidence um, when I'm trying to figure out what's going on on the subsurface. Uh, I really like this pet quote. We would do well to recall and examine the attributes necessary for the successful practice of subsurface engineering. There's at least three, knowledge of precedence, that's your case histories, familiarity with soil mechanics, and a working knowledge of geology. And we're talking about the process-based geologic environment and geomorphic environment. But of these, familiarity with precedence is by far the most important. So that's knowing your case histories and how projects have failed in the past, what went wrong, and how we can not repeat those mistakes. Um, often, it's the geology that's the problem. Geologic features that can lead to failure of a structure are not directly observable until after the failure has occurred. That's something very important to remember. That's something that's come out of a lot of our case histories. An example is the Camera Dam failure in 2012. Um, there, wasn't a, there was an incomplete understanding of the abutment geology, and it led to failure of the project two years after it was built. One of the notes that came out of it, though, is the failure was strikingly similar to the St. Francis failure. And if the designers had understood what happened at St. Francis, Saint, excuse me, St. Francis, perhaps they could have oriented their site investigation program differently and captured that variable before um, it inevitably led to failure. So again, we revisit the Trizaghi's method of working, and this is just to summarize everything together. Um, one of the key points in this method of working is identifying our missing gaps in the geologic information. And what we're doing in all of these steps is making a plan to fill in our missing gaps. That means we have to understand, though, what potentially those missing gaps entail. Um, geology, geologic engineering, these are empirical fields. They're riddled with geologic variability, knowledge uncertainty, because we don't have a lens into the subsurface. So we have large knowledge gaps. So be aware with everything you're doing that one of our biggest goals in our investigations is to characterize our uncertainty. Um, this is, I think, one of the most critical roles of the geologist. Communicate that uncertainty because geology is gonna be your key condition with a unfavorable but yet conceivable 
um, deviation. So just a few parting thoughts. I really like this chart of site investigation failings. Essentially on the Y scale, we see um, you know, what, what could happen, what the failing could look like. Our interpretation was wrong. The facts were misleading. The rock condition was in, inaccurately assessed. And then what the impact of that failing in our site characterization looks like. A lot of these lead to major cost increases, especially if we're not using our techniques appropriately. Um, maybe there's unforeseen ground conditions, additional work, um, claims, construction claims. Those are brutal. They can take up a lot of time on your project. Um, spend some extra time with that chart. It gives you an idea of some of the importance, again, of your site characterization. Um, and just remain pitfalls of understanding the subsurface. Be skeptical. Just because it's plausible doesn't mean it's probable. Um, and again, while geology is often the bad guy, we, we do want to root our uncertainty in the context of what is observed or processes that are understood, such as the depositional environment. And so that's all I have.